But what I want to talk about is this question of why the necks of giraffes are so short, uh, topping out at a really feeble 2.4 meters, compared with the very much longer necks of sauropods. And to put that into context, let's look at some necks. Uh, we'll begin here with the human neck, which is, uh, if you just measure the vertebrae, it's about 15 centimeters long. And that's on this uh, scale here of one meter bars in alternating colors. Here's the giraffe in comparison to that, obviously much longer than the human neck. And there have been other animals through life uh, that have had long necks. At the moment, the next best we have that's alive now is the ostrich, which doesn't even reach a meter in length. So that's disappointing. But if you go back a little further, Paraceratherium, the giant rhinoceros, had a, a neck about two meters long. Uh, Therizinosaurus is one of several dinosaurs that had necks a little over two meters in length, probably, although these are often based on fragmentary fossils. Another of those is Dinochirus. Uh, another is Gigantoraptor. And you can see all of these have necks very much about the same length, which perhaps suggests there are some fundamental limits that make it difficult for necks to get much longer than that. Um, one exception to that, the, the biggest neck I know from a, uh, a non-marine animal, so an animal that had to hold its neck up without the support of water, the longest non-sauropod neck I know is from the pterosaur Aromborgiana, uh, which is just crazy construction. That long, thin vertebrae with very little apparent structure and how that works mechanically, I don't know. And if ever I were to stop working on sauropods, this would be the animal that I would look at. Um, and these are big animals. Uh, that's Paraceratherium at the top, Therizinosaurus bottom left and Gigantoraptor bottom right. And you can see how big they are compared with a, a man on a bicycle. But all of these necks are absolutely dwarfed by those of the longest necked sauropods. So what we've got here is the last three and a half uh, cervical vertebrae of Supersaurus uh, in a fairly conservative reconstruction. Uh, and you can see that just the, the first two of these vertebrae alone are already as long as any other neck that's ever existed. Um, this is Barosaurus in the American Museum of Natural History. The vertebra that's, no, that's assigned to Supersaurus, Matt and I think actually belongs to a very large individual of Barosaurus. So it's from an animal very similar to this one, but something like twice the size. Uh, so this is me at bottom left. I don't know if you can make me out on your screens. Standing next to the American Museum mount of a Barosaurus about half the size of how big we think it got. Uh, so let's compare the necks of a few different sauropods to get a sense of, of how those necks relate to each other. This is probably the one most people have seen. It's Diplodocus, uh, six and a half meter long neck. And this is the sauropod that's on display in the Carnegie Museum in Pittsburgh in America, and that also has casts all over the world. And I've seen them in uh, London in England, Madrid, Spain, uh, Berlin, of course, in Germany, and I think there's one in Frankfurt and various other places. So it's a very well-known skeleton. Um, but sauropod necks got a lot longer than that. This is Puertosaurus, a titanosaur. Only one cervical vertebra is known, but it's enough to give us a reasonable sense of the neck. Uh, here's a reconstruction of Sauroposeidon, which uh, at the time this artwork was produced was thought to be a Brachiosaurid, so similar to Brachiosaurus and Giraffotitan. Uh, it's now thought to be uh, a, a little further down the tree than that, but still, the length of the neck here is about right. Uh, Memenchisaurus is a, a very distantly related Chinese sauropod, also with a, a very long neck, known to reach uh, 12 meters. Uh, and here is Supersaurus, uh, which we've already met. And here, what we're seeing, I've just scaled up the, the Diplodocus neck to 15 meters, just to give a rough sense of how this would compare. Uh, and these are the non-sauropods that I had earlier to the same scale, just to reinforce uh, 
how ludicrously sauropods surpassed the limits that seems to apply to every other animal. They were obviously doing something dramatically different from everything else. Uh, and as I said, there seems to be a barrier of, well, three meters if you count Arambogiania, more like two meters for everything else, which sauropods repeatedly did not just break, but smashed. And the thing that's surprising is that if you look at the family tree of sauropods, this uh, cladogram is a little out of date now, but the, the broad structure of it is still pretty much how sauropod phylogeneticists think things were. The very long necks that we've looked at, you can see are scattered all over that cladogram. So it isn't as though there was a single small clade of very long necked sauropods, but that within all the major groups, uh, Mamenchisaurids, Diplodocids, Brachiosaurids, Titanosaurians, they all seem to have evolved representatives with extremely long necks. Um, so what's going on here? Evidently, there was something going on down here fairly early in the history of sauropods uh, where something happened anatomically that made it possible for all of these groups to evolve long necks. But note that the, there's no reason to think that this, um, the sauropod down here at the base of this subtree was itself long necked. It seems that the anatomical innovations that made long necks possible evolved around this point, but weren't really fully pressed into service in the way that they would be further down the line. So what I would like to do in this talk is look at some of the ways that sauropods were able to evolve and sustain such long necks. And I want to clarify, I'm going to talk about how they did it, not about why. If you want to know why sauropod necks are so long, um, actually uh, Martin Sander wrote the, or lead authored, what's currently still the definitive paper on that in, I think, 1999. And I'm sure he can give you all the reference if you haven't all learned it and memorized it already. Uh, talking about the reasons why it was advantageous for sauropods to have long necks related to uh, food gathering largely. Um, but what I want to look at is not why they did, but how it was achieved. And there are several reasons. Uh, here is the first of uh, four or five that we want to look at. The first is that sauropods seem to have no constraint on how many vertebrae they had. So by contrast, here's Paraceratherium again, uh, the giant rhinoceros with uh, one of the longest mammal necks we know of. And like basically all mammals, it has only seven cervical vertebrae. So one of the classic ways of neck elongation is simply to have more vertebrae in the neck. And that's taken to an extreme in elasmosaurid plesiosaurs, uh, which can have uh, more than 70 uh, vertebrae in their necks. But each individual vertebra is quite short, so they, they never get nearly as long as the necks of sauropods. But while sauropods didn't get anywhere near as many cervicals as those, uh, they did get up to at least 19 we know of from uh, some species of Mimicosaurus uh, and possibly more. Uh, so going on for three times as many cervical vertebrae as any mammal has. Uh, second thing that made it possible for sauropods to have such long necks is that they were able to have small heads. Uh, and obviously the longer the lever of the neck is, the greater uh, moment the force of the weight of the head exerts on that neck. So it makes it harder to hold the head up. Why did sauropods have small heads? Well, it's because their whole approach to uh, digestion was not to bother processing food in the mouth. So the, the big comparison here is with something like an elephant, which has a massive head. And the reason it has a massive head primarily is so it can have massive teeth in massive jaws so that it can orally process the food that it ingests. And sauropods, uh, I was going to say by design, almost as though it were deliberate. Obviously, it wasn't. We're not claiming that there's a deliberate trajectory to evolution. But the approach they took was the opposite, which was not to process food in the mouth at all, so that the mouth essentially is just a, a food gathering organ, um, where then the food was digested by extensive hindgut fermentation that Nicole Klein can tell you much more about. So because of this uh, very different design, uh, this works. But this wouldn't. Uh, uh, an elephant's head on the end of a sauropod's neck would not be sustainable. So not having elephant-sized heads was good for sauropods. Having elephant-sized bodies was good for them as well. 
Uh, if you think about a giraffe, why does its neck have to be as short as it is? Well, you could argue that the, the reason it's as long as it is is so it can reach back down to the ground from the top of its tall legs. But it's got very little going on by way of a torso. Uh, a giraffe is basically like a cow with a, a stretched neck and legs. It's not, well, I say it's not a big animal. It's bigger than you or me. But for someone who works on sauropods, it's not a big animal. And of course, if you put a, a sauropod-sized neck on a giraffe, it simply isn't mechanically sustainable. So simply possessing very large torsos was necessary for sauropods to have necks as long as they did by providing a mechanically sound platform. And similarly, it was necessary for them to have uh, a quadrupedal platform. So if you think about a, a Tyrannosaurus, that's thought to have massed somewhere between five and 10 tons, which is the size of a, of a, of a big elephant. Um, and the torso of a big elephant is not that different in size from the torso of a Diplodocus. But it can't have a long neck, uh, again, because of the stability of the platform. Um, if you have a Diplodocus length neck on a Tyrannosaurus, it just doesn't have the stability to prevent everything going horribly wrong. Now, we've talked about absolutely large bodies uh, and the idea that a sauropod with a, a larger torso can have a, a longer neck. Um, a little bit of work, not enough really, has been done on the relationship between uh, sauropod torsos and necks. And it turns out, based on this work uh, done by uh, Michael Parrish in 2006, that the neck length of a sauropod doesn't grow linearly with torso length, but with torso length to the power 1.35. So what that means is a sauropod with a larger torso will, in general, also have a disproportionately longer neck. Um, and there's just a a moment there to take a little bit of caution from the Barosaurus skeleton that I showed you early in this talk when I said that Matt and I think that the individual that the so-called Supersaurus vertebra comes from was twice as big. What we really think is that that individual's neck was twice as long. But if this uh, allometric relationship holds good, then probably the torso that that longer neck was attached to was less than twice as big as that of the American museum specimen. Bigger, but not twice as big. Uh, and to see one of these extremely large, very long-necked sauropods would have been uh, a bizarre thing, not only just because they're so huge, but also because their necks would seem disproportionately long to us compared with the sauropods that we're used to seeing, or at least used to seeing the skeletons of. This is just a... It, it's a dream vertebra, really. <laughs> Uh, what I've done here is uh, I've taken a vertebra from the base of the neck of Diplodocus and uh, back in 2006 when Amphicelius fragilimus, uh, a giant diplodosoid, was thought to resemble Diplodocus in, in general shape and size, I applied the Parrish uh, equation uh, and that suggested that if the torso of Amphicelius fragilimus, which is only known from a dorsal vertebra, were indeed 2.2 times as big as that of Diplodocus, then it would follow, if that were the case, and if it were Diplodocus shaped, that the neck would be 2.9 times as long. So if that were so, and if the neck were 22 meters long, this is how big a single vertebra from the base of the neck of that animal would be, compared with, uh, that's me on the scale bar here. And I'll note in passing that that one vertebra, if that's correctly scaled, which is a very big if, uh, would be, on its own longer than the world record giraffe neck. Uh, now, since I prepared this illustration, uh, Amphicelius fragilimus ha has been revised and is now thought to have belonged to a different group of sauropods, the Rabacosaurids, whose necks were proportionally shorter. So in a vertebra probably would have been uh, quite a bit shorter than this, uh, probably somewhere on the order of 60% as long. Uh, but you know, that's still nothing to sneeze at. Let's move on to the fourth reason that sauropods were able to have such long necks. Uh, one of the reasons that it's difficult to have a long neck is that it's hard to breathe through a long tube. Um, as you will have found if you've ever tried to do it yourself, breathe through a garden hose, uh, you simply can't do it. You can cut a, a section of hose, uh, maybe a metre long, you might just about be able to breathe through that, but you'll be struggling. Uh, so, how can you breathe through a 15 metre long hose? 
Uh, part of the answer, of course, is that the trachea of a sauropod would have been much broader than a garden hose. But then that introduces another problem, which is there's so much dead space with the air sitting in the trachea needing to be sucked back down to the lungs and pushed back out. Uh, and if you had a mammal with a neck that long, I think it, it would struggle to get in the oxygen it needed rather than constantly re-inhaling and exhaling the same uh, dead air from its trachea. And the reason that that wouldn't have been a problem for sauropods is because we have good lines of evidence suggesting that their respiratory system much more closely resembled that of birds than of mammals. So in particular, as well as the actual lungs, they will have had these extensive air sacs uh, in the torso and abdomen and uh, in the neck. Um, and the evidence for these uh, is that they invade the bones, yielding the pneumatic features that we're used to seeing in sauropod vertebrae and that make sauropod vertebrae so distinctive. All the uh, fossae and foraminae and laminae are all traces left by uh, air sacs, well, uh, by diverticula, which are sort of extensions of the main air sacs that we used in respiration. And the most startling thing about bird lungs, uh, and those of you who are on the biological side will know this, of course, uh, is that bird lungs uh, have the air flowing through in one direction. So rather than wasting time like we stupid mammals do by breathing air all the way down into the bottom of the lungs and then breathing the same air back out again, and they're moving air through the lungs all the while in a single direction. And they do this by a, a complex and elegant system of uh, compressing and expanding the air sacs anterior and posterior to the lung so that on both the inhalation and exhalation, they're still moving air through the lung in the same direction. So it's a much more efficient respiratory arrangement and that's why when even the very fittest human climbers uh, need oxygen uh, at the top of high mountains, uh, on top of Everest, uh, you simply cannot survive there even if you are the fittest human because you can't get enough oxygen into your body. Uh, and yet birds fly with energetically demanding flapping powered flight at that same altitude with that same very, very depleted amount of oxygen in the air. And the reason they're able to do it is because of this far more efficient respiratory system, which seems to have been shared by sauropods. Now, this line of evidence, I hope, has sounded very persuasive to you. I've certainly tried to persuade you. But I, in fact, Matt Wadle and I, um, oh, I should have said at the beginning, uh, very important. This talk is not just my work. This also comes from work that was done with Matt Wadle from Western University of Health Sciences. And the ideas in this, uh, we've extensively workshopped back and forth over many years before the paper that it was based on came out. Um, and one of the things that occurred to us after we'd formulated this particular line of evidence is this. What on earth is going on with sperm whales? Now, their lung is somewhere near the middle of the body. Um, you can see the lung here connected via the trachea to the blowhole, which is right at the front of the snout. Uh, the other black blob there below it is the heart. And whales are very inconvenient for this line of reasoning uh, because, as you know, they have an incredibly efficient respiratory system that enables them to survive for uh, half an hour or more on a single breath, even while doing energetically demanding things like diving down hundreds of metres or deeper in the sea. So whatever I was saying about the, the long trachea being an impediment perhaps isn't quite so... It's one of these situations where you can evolve a really elegant theory and then along comes an actual animal to immediately blow it up for you. And it makes me think a little bit about how when I was a kid growing up, uh, the biggest known pterosaur then was Pteranodon with about a six metre wingspan. And everybody knew in those days that that was the fundamental limit. You couldn't have a bigger flying animal than Pteranodon for fundamental physical reasons. And sure enough, just as this became uh, established as a well-known fact, uh, along came bones of Quetzalcoatlus, which was a pterosaur of something like twice the size. Um, so animals do have this inconvenient habit of contravening our carefully assembled theories. And whales do that. Uh, so that really is an area that we need to look into. And before I move on from the whale, I'd just like to point out one other thing. Look at the shape of the trachea here. Now, you would think that a whale with all its difficulty in breathing would want to make the trachea as short as possible, that the blowhole would be further back on the head, 
so that it doesn't have such a long journey for the air to make between the blowhole and the lung. But not only is it right at the front of the, the head, the trachea doesn't even go in a straight line. It takes this ridiculous little U-shaped excursion that makes it longer than it needs to be. So, which sort of suggests that it's, it's not just doing okay, it's doing more than fine if it can afford this sort of unnecessary elaboration. So somehow or another, we're going to need to rethink what's going on with uh, tracheal dead space and mammal breathing. So now we come really to the, to the substance of what I want to talk about. This is the, it's the fifth and last point, but it, it's the biggest one by some distance, and it has several sub points. Uh, and it's the architecture of the individual vertebrae of sauropods is one of the big factors that made it possible for their necks to grow so long. So I want to uh, get a little more technical in this uh, second half of the talk, and we'll need to understand a bit about uh, the anatomy of a vertebra. So again, apologies to those of you who already know this stuff, but for anyone who doesn't, uh, the body of the vertebra uh, down towards the bottom of this picture is called the centrum. And it runs from here, we're looking at a vertebra from the right hand side. So the front of it, the anterior, is to our right. You can see that there's a ball on the front and then running back from there to where the word centrum is written is what's nominally a sort of a cylinder shape. Although in, so in most animals, it is more or less a cylinder in sauropods. It's so excavated and distorted that it doesn't look like one. But that body, the body of the vertebra is called the centrum. Now above that, sticking upwards, is the neural spine. Um, in humans, of course, because stupidly we hold our vertebral columns vertically instead of horizontally like everyone else does, apart from penguins, the neural spines stick out of our backs. But for most animals, uh, where the, the torso and the neck are, are roughly horizontal, the neural spine sticks upwards. Now, the front of the centrum of each vertebra articulates with the back of the centrum of the next one. In sauropods, in the next sauropods at least, that means that the ball we see in this picture fits into a socket on the back of the centrum. But there are also other places where the vertebrae articulate, and those are called the zygopophyses. And there are two pairs of those. At the front of the vertebra, there's a pair of pre-zygopophyses, one on the left, one on the right. And at the back, uh, facing inwards, so you can't see the facets here, are the post-zygopophyses. And obviously, the pre-zygopophyses of each vertebra articulate with the post-zygopophyses of the one in front. So I hope that isn't too much anatomy dumped on you all at once. And for those of you who already know all this, uh, I'm sorry to have burdened you with the repetition. But with that in our minds, we can now look at three specific innovations in the vertebrae of sauropods that don't seem to be found anywhere else, uh, which go some way to explaining how neck elongation was possible. And the first of these is pneumaticity. Now that is the term that describes the invasion of air into the bones. Uh, we think of it in sauropods. In extant animals, we see it in birds. Now what we have here is a cross section of an ostrich neck. Uh, the sort of gray oval that we see is all flesh of various kinds, uh, skin and muscle and fat and so on. The white is bone uh, and the black is air spaces. And you can see that there are air spaces uh, around the bone, uh, marked with A in here. Uh, and in the neural canal, and that's where it's marked B, you can see the neural canal is roughly circular. But the top half of the neural canal, at least at this place in the neck, has three uh, diverticular air spaces running through it. And the spinal cord itself will have been in the bottom half. Uh, but also inside the bone itself, uh, not labelled in this uh, illustration, all those black spaces are where there is air inside the bone. So that's what we mean by pneumaticity. And when we talk about pneumatic features in a bone, we mean the features that make it possible. Now, one of the things you'll notice here is that the fleshy envelope surrounding the vertebra is very thick. It's uh, going on for three times as tall as the vertebra itself. So the neck is much taller than the vertebra. And that's true of most animals. It's true of humans. If you think about how thick your neck is, and compare that with the relatively small size of the vertebrae in your neck, you'll see that the fleshy envelope is very thick. Um, but that's not the case in sauropods. Nobody illustrates their sauropods like this with huge, fat, thick, fleshy envelopes around the vertebrae. So what's going on there? Why are we not doing that? Uh, so this is what we never see. 
Um, let's look at how the cross sections of nexal sauropods might have looked. Now this is an old uh, speculative reconstruction from one of Greg Paul's papers in the 1990s. And here you can see there's a pretty extreme shrink wrapping going on around the vertebra. And I don't think people would really take this very seriously these days. But it's one extreme at least that has made it into the published literature. Here's a, a more recent and I think more credible reconstruction. This is by Daniela Schwartz et al. from 2007. And the main thing to take away from this one is the bone itself we're seeing in, uh, in black. The airspace is now in blue. And all of the muscle and fat and skin and so forth we're seeing in uh, pink here. Now you can see that there's plenty more flesh on this cross section than in Greg Paul's version but still much less than there is in an ostrich. So if we were to put uh, this Diplodocus vertebra cross-section inside the ostrich, scaled to the same size as the ostrich vertebra, we'd have this situation, which we know isn't how it was. You remember I showed you the, the reconstruction of the fat neck Diplodocus, and hopefully when you saw that, you all laughed. I, know I couldn't hear any of you, because it is a pretty ludicrous idea. Uh, but why were we not getting this? Is it that we're getting this instead? Is it that there's less soft tissue involved in the necks of sauropods? Uh, I don't think that's an accurate way to think of it. I think this is a much uh, better way to express what's going on. If you think of uh, the outer envelope of the neck being a more or less fixed size, the situation with sauropods is more that the vertebrae within that fleshy envelope are much larger. You could almost say they've been inflated. So again here, we've used the same schema as we had with the ostrich, where the bone itself is in white, the air spaces are in black. There would have been more air spaces outside the vertebra here as well. So what we're seeing is that the vertebrae of sauropods are uh, larger, not only in an absolute sense, but in a relative sense, than they are in uh, other long-necked animals, such as ostriches uh, and also uh, giraffes. And we must assume those other extinct animals for which we don't really know the fleshy envelope. And the reason that they were able to be so much larger without being excessively heavy is precisely because of this extreme pneumatization that so much of what would have been air was in uh, what would have been bone was instead air because the bones were so constructed that there's bone along the lines of force, but that wherever there was less force acting on the bone it became invaded by these air spaces. Now the other place we see this uh, same kind of, I kind of want to call it design of bones, again is in birds. Uh, not only the vertebrae, but what we've got here is a sectioned uh, humerus, I think, of a red-tailed hawk on the right-hand side of the screen. And I hope you can make out here that there's a, a well-defined a bone wall of compact bone, you can see it more easily running down the right hand side than the left. But inside that bone, you've got lots of uh, struts of bone filling what's otherwise an, an airy space, which means that the bone itself was physically very light in life, uh, even though it was very strong because uh, most of the bending force uh, runs along the outsides of the bone. So hawks and other birds achieve. Um, great strength in their limb bones, uh, relatively little cost of weight, uh, which really is one of the, the secrets of their ability to fly. And sauropods seem to have been doing much the same thing with their necks. Here's a second very distinctive feature of the vertebrae of sauropods. Now here we're looking at a posterior cervical vertebrae of a patasaurus and we're looking at it from behind. So you can see the hollow in the centrum here much more clearly than in the picture I showed you earlier. And there's a ball on the front that we can't see here. Uh, and you can see that instead of having a single neural spine at the top sticking upwards, there's, you could characterize it as a pair of spines, or you could call it a single spine that has been uh, bifurcated or split in two, or we call it bifid. Now the striking thing about this morphology, uh, and this really is kind of recapitulating something I said earlier about neck length, is that it crops up at seemingly random places across the family tree. Uh, they evolved at least five times among sauropods, uh, among the Mamenchisaurids, among Diplodocids, in Camarasaurus, uh, and I would say among uh, several sauropods that are Camarasaurid but have not yet been recognised as being distinct. Uh, 
and in some basal sulfospondylians and in some titanosaurs. But what you'll also see here is, as well as these uh, animals that I've highlighted in pink that have bifid neural spines, there are lots in white that don't have them. So again, what we're seeing is separate evolutionary origins of bifurcated neural spines. They crop up several times. Uh, and as far as we can see, from this cladogram at least, they don't seem to have ever been secondarily lost. Now, we don't really have enough evidence to say that with any confidence, but that's the way things look at the moment. Now, do we see bifid neural spines in any other animal but sauropods? Really, the answer is no. Um, occasionally, you'll see things like some cattle have little notches at the tops of their neural spines, and it's sometimes said that the rhea, uh, a flightless bird related to ostrich and emus, the rhea uh, has bifurcated neural spines, but really it doesn't. If you look at their vertebrae, I should have put a picture in this presentation, but I didn't, sorry. If you look at their vertebrae, the bifurcation they have bears no relation really to what we see in sauropods. It's just a little nubbins. Now what's going on with this uh, bifurcated spine? Uh, McNeil Alexander, the kind of pioneering dinosaur biomechanist, thought in 1985 that the whole trough was filled with a gigantic elastin ligament, similar to the elastic nuchal ligament that some uh, ungulates have. Um, and he ran some numbers that just about showed that a huge ligament like this could have enough uh, tensile strength to uh, hold up the neck of a diplodocus. But in fact, it, it can't have been as straightforward as that. Uh, here's one reason. This is a, another cervical vertebra of a patasaurus, not the same one we saw earlier. And here we're looking at it from a rather unhelpful perspective. We're slightly seeing it from the right-hand side and slightly from behind and slightly from above. So at the top, you can see kind of wings spreading out. Those are the two halves of the bifid neural spine. And in between them, see an interesting thing. First, there's this big, and it is big, it's sort of the size of a cricket ball or a baseball, this uh, bony lump with a very rugose texture, which is obviously a site for ligament attachment. So this seems to have been uh, suspending a ligament or, or holding place of a ligament between vertebrae for sure. So as far as that goes, it sort of supports Neil Alexander's idea. But right next to it, we have this foramen, this little hole penetrating the bone by which air will have got inside the vertebra. And that can only have happened, of course, if there was air immediately outside the vertebra on the other side of the bone. So we know that in this vertebra, and quite possibly in, in many or most sauropod vertebrae, we had both ligaments connecting the uh, upper parts of the vertebrae, but also air spaces around the same area. So it must have been more complex than what McNeil Alexander depicted there. Uh, and again, if we look back at that uh, schwartz hattel diagram I showed you earlier, you can see that what they've depicted here is um, some ligament in red, uh, but it's very, very much smaller than what McNeil Alexander depicted, and quite possibly uh, much more of a collagen ligament than an elastin one. So it would have been less stretchy, but have greater absolute strength. Uh, and all around there, we have these diverticula, these air spaces, as well as the muscles. I must emphasize again, this reconstruction, like any sauropod neck cross-section you see, is still highly speculative. Certain amount can be known about the muscle groups and so on, but it's the, the extent, the size of the muscles, um, there's always going to be guesswork involved in those. So what are the bifid neural spines doing? Well, if you imagine a, a cantilevered structure like a girder sticking out from a building, maybe because you're going to hang a sign on it, um, what you tend to have is two tension members above it, one on each side. Uh, and then the sign hanging from this is stabilized, uh, and the girder not only is prevented from falling downwards, but also won't drift left and right. Uh, and that's true of passive structures, but equally with an active structure that you want to be able to move uh, then you would also want to attach uh, these tension members separately both left and right of the object so that you have that control in both directions. Now you get better control if the attachment points are moved to the side, like in the handlebars of a bicycle. Um, and if you want to imagine for yourself what that's like, think about riding a bicycle but moving your hands away from the handles to the middle of the handlebars and trying to steer it with your hands very close together. You can do it, but it's much more difficult. Whereas you have a better mechanical advantage if you use the 
handles far out on the side. So we suspect that this was something uh, that was an advantage of bifid neural spines. Not necessarily that the spines made it easier to hold the neck up, but possibly contributed to making it easier to move the neck, perhaps in very precise ways. And it's possible that those sauropod lineages that evolved bifid neural spines were the ones that needed, maybe for lifestyle reasons, more precise kinds of movements of the neck. Now here, again, there's some speculation going on. We should think more about how we could test this idea. At the moment, this is as far as we've got. And the third and final detail of the cervical vertebral architecture that I want to talk about here is the elongate cervical ribs. Now, uh, cervical, of course, means of the neck. So what this means is ribs in the neck. And is in human anatomy, we're used to ribs being in the torso, but not the neck. But various kinds of animals, including birds, have ribs in the neck as well. So here we're looking at a vertebra of a turkey, which I prepared myself. In the middle, we're seeing left side of it, so facing to the left. And then around it, we see um, the front and back views to the left and right, and the top and bottom views above and below. And you can see in several of these views, the cervical ribs. Uh, they're short, they're robust, they're attached at the front of the vertebra, they point backwards, and they're there for the attachment of muscles, ventral muscles that are used for drawing the neck downwards. Now, in all birds, as far as I'm aware, at least, these ribs are always short. Uh, in some groups of sauropods, that's also true. Apatosaurus had fairly short cervical ribs that didn't reach the, the length of the vertebra. But in some other sauropods, they were very, very long. Uh, this is a single cervical rib of Hermenchisaurus, uh, thanks to David Hone for providing this photograph. 4.1 metres long. Uh, and again, to put that into context, remember this is one rib from a vertebra in the neck of a sauropod. Here is the world record giraffe with its 2.4 metre neck compared with that single cervical rib. And you can just see what the scale is of these things. Now, what were they doing with the cervical ribs? Well, here's a, a, a rough idea of what could be going on. This is uh, our old friend Giraffe Titan, the Brachiosaurid. This is Matt Wadle's reconstruction. And here I've picked out a single vertebra in pink and you would have ventral muscles used for drawing down the neck attached to the cervical rib and attaching that to the loop holding the rib and the vertebra behind. And you see this in, in birds or many animals, actually. Now, if you have long enough cervical ribs, instead of being attached like this, you can move the muscles further back down towards the base of the neck uh, and have the same effect. Uh, because the uh, bone doesn't stretch, so you'll be pulling with the same effect so rather than just stretching tendon. Uh, and that's why there's an advantage for a long-necked animal in having a bony extended cervical rib. Why do you want to have your muscle at the base of the neck? Because the closer it is to the torso, the less mechanical advantage its weight acts with. So the weight of those muscles, which in some cases would have been pretty big, um, is not so strongly affecting the neck and trying to pull it down through gravity as you move the muscle to the back of the neck. Now, you may think if you're doing this with the ventral muscles that pull the neck downwards, why not do the same with the dorsal muscles that lift the neck upwards, which of course is a much more difficult job since the sauropod neck will tend to go down anyway, thanks to gravity. Uh, why don't, here's uh, how it could look. These are some vertebrae from the neck of Euhelopus, it's a Chinese sauropod. And here we can see muscles attaching to the epipophyses, that's um, the muscle uh, attachment point just above the postzygopophysis, so at the top of the vertebra, and to the cervical rib below. Now, we know that this does happen, elongation of the cervical ribs, that is able to displace the ventral muscles further back and closer to the torso. This is the thing that we think, well, why shouldn't that happen too? Why wouldn't this be more useful? There are a couple of reasons why we think this is not what happened. Now, before I get on to the reasons why it doesn't happen, let me dispose uh, of one that we might have thought of. We could have said, well, perhaps it just turns out not to be evolutionarily possible and the right genes aren't there and it's just one of those things that the, the mechanisms aren't there to evolve. That isn't the case because there are um, very elongate uh, 
dorsal attachment points in other Sauruskian dinosaurs. What we're seeing here is Deinonychus, the, um, the raptor that they used in Jurassic Park and called Velociraptor. This is the tail of that animal. And you can see that, uh, well, here we're looking at the, uh, uh, the pre zygopophyses are highlighted. You can see the post zygopophyses are even longer. So this is possible. And in the case of these animals, it, it's thought that what's going on here is that they were there stiffening the tail and making the tail act as a sort of single uh, stiff member. But that's not going on with sauropods. Obviously, you wouldn't have wanted to stiffen the neck because it needs to be flexible. So reasons this isn't happening. OK, here's the first one. Imagine it was. Here are a couple of articulated vertebrae of giraffe titan. I have uh, clumsily drawn in the cervical ribs below and these putative extended epipophyses above, which is what could be used to move the muscles backwards. So the first thing to be aware of is that uh, for finer control, which you need for precise movements, you require shorter levers. Now, moving the neck down for sauropods probably didn't even require a great deal of precision. Imagine that likely they're moving down maybe to get towards a body of water or something large like that to drink. Whereas in elevating the neck, perhaps they would have been doing that in an attempt to reach a particular uh, piece of foliage or perhaps something more nutritious. So their finer movement would have been necessary. Uh, and therefore you want the muscles to be closest to the attachment points. Uh, second reason was a real surprise to me when I discovered this, which is that tendon is stronger in tension than bone is. So bone is stiffer, of course, but it's more likely to break under tension, under being stretched, which is what happens in these uh, positions above the vertebral axis. So if bone were used here rather than tendon to attach the muscles to these points, then that would have been in more danger of breaking. And the third reason is this. Uh, the, ax the epaxial muscles, those are the ones above the vertebra, would have needed to be larger and stronger than those below uh, in order to raise the neck. And of course, when muscles uh, contract lengthways, they expand. And when they expand, they would have shifted these uh, bony, um, I don't want to call them exactly, rods, I guess. Uh, and of course, if you, if you take something like bone that is stiff and you push it sideways, you bend it, and it snaps. So there was a danger there of some kind of catastrophic failure uh, that would not have gone down well at all for the sauropod. So these are some of the reasons why we think the uh, muscles above the neck were not displaced back towards the torso in the way that muscles below the neck were. Did I say that right? The muscles above the neck were not displaced backwards. The muscles below the neck were. So as you come to a conclusion, uh, we've got these um, five things in the end uh, that contribute to making it possible to evolve a very long neck. So having many vertebrae, you remember, as uh, sauropods do in birds, but mammals don't. Having a small head with no dental battery that was used for chewing and processing food orally, but instead just digesting it down in the gut. Having a large four-legged body that provides a platform. Uh, having air sacs and a bird-style lung that makes uh, more efficient respiration possible down a long trachea. And having the... Uh, vertebrae with the uh, pneumatic features that enable those vertebrae to be physically larger without becoming heavier and therefore to uh, better fill the flesh envelope of the neck and uh, the elongate cervical ribs that make it possible to shift muscle mass ventrally and as we look across our candidate animals that have fairly long necks that we started the talk with we can see that sauropods get ticks in every box uh, pterosaurs only have two of them theropods three the good old ostrich has four but really uh, fails just because it's so small, it's a small animal, so its neck is about as long as it can be. But giraffes strikingly fail in every single respect. Uh, they don't have many vertebrae, they're limited to seven, like almost all mammals. They have, we think of a giraffe's head as being small, but it's, uh, it's not nothing. It's a, it is a piece of equipment for, for chewing and grinding up uh, some extremely tough vegetation. It has a, a small body in the scheme of things, cow-sized body, even though it's got four legs, it's just not big enough body to carry a long head. Uh, it doesn't have any air sacs, it has an inefficient mammalian lung 
Uh, it doesn't have any pneumatic features in its vertebrae. The vertebrae are, uh, well, I was going to say solid bone. Obviously, uh, like all bone, it, it can be spongy and have marrow and so forth, but not air spaced. Uh, and finally, it has no cervical ribs at all, let alone elongate cervical ribs. So these are some of the reasons uh, why giraffes have such short necks. And if anything, we should really be applauding giraffes for managing to have even half decent necks under all these handicaps. Uh, so that's where I'm going to leave it. I really appreciate you all listening. I love talking about this stuff and it's been a real privilege for me. Um, everybody who allowed us access to specimens along the way, thank you, all of you. Um, and uh, this is a picture of the reconstructed neck of Sora Poseidon, along with uh, Matt himself, who uh, had the privilege of describing and naming the three and a half vertebrae that form the holotype of that animal. And with that, I am done.